Hello, I'm Sheena Reagan, Manager of Business Development at BC Ferries. We are delighted to introduce today's keynote speaker, Kendra McDonald, the CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Today, Kendra is going to share with us some of Canada's immense ocean opportunities, which I know is going to be an interesting and valuable session for all of us. We are delighted to sponsor this session and to support the island economy. Please come and join us at our virtual exhibitor booth today and connect with us. Thank you and enjoy the session. Hi, Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. I've been a part of this summit since day one. I've been at every single one of them in various roles. This time I'm here as the CEO of the Chamber, but also here to introduce our keynote speaker at this presentation, which is being done through the courtesy and the sponsorship of BC Ferries. So thanks very much to them for that. Uh, yeah, so Kendra McDonald, CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster. She drives innovation and growth in the ocean economy. There are things happening on Vancouver Island that are new and things that have been going on for a long time. But innovation in the ocean space is something that's really starting to pick up speed. You've probably heard conversations about here in Victoria, where I am, uh, there's talk of an ocean cluster happening, uh, an oceans project that will take advantage of the fact that we have marine tech industries here, we have marine maintenance, we have BC ferries, we have um, all of the organizations involved in ocean research, including UVic and the Ocean Network of Canada. So this work that Kendra is going to be talking about today applies to us here on the island and all the things that have been happening up and down the coasts of this island for a long, long time. Uh, she's going to demonstrate the momentum building as Canada's ocean supercluster helps drive unprecedented multi-sector collaboration and engagement across the country and around the world, too. So enough about me. Let's hand it over to Kendra, who is with us virtually from St. John's, Newfoundland. Kendra. With the longest coastline in the world, fourth largest ocean territory, and significant Arctic territory, Canada's biggest asset is also its biggest opportunity. Our ocean story has a long history that has helped shape us as a nation, providing a source of food, energy, transportation, business, and a way of life. Today, in the face of a $3 trillion global ocean opportunity, we are answering the call for sustainable economic growth. Striving for balance and expanding ocean opportunities while also addressing ocean health. We are building solutions to shared ocean challenges for the global market, developing cutting edge ocean technology, facilitating greater connectivity, increasing data exchange, expanding talent, capability, and diversity, and making this the best place to start and grow an ocean company. And we're doing this by bringing ocean industries together in a way that's never been done before. Leaders in fisheries, aquaculture, offshore resources, transport, defense, marine renewables, bioresources, and ocean technologies are working together to rapidly innovate, commercialize solutions, reach global markets, and grow the ocean economy. Together, we are advancing Canada's position as a global leader in ocean. Canada's Ocean Supercluster, changing the way ocean business is done. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kendra McDonald, and I'm the CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, and it is my great pleasure to be able to join you today at this economic summit to share some important uh, information about uh, where we are with Canada's Ocean Supercluster and the opportunity that it represents for the country. So as you saw in the opening video, Canada has 243,000 kilometers of coastline. We have the Arctic, the Pacific, and the Atlantic. We have the fourth largest ocean territory in the world. Productive ecosystems, subsea resources, and tremendous untapped potential. Unmatched expertise and experience across ocean industries and technology, science, education, 
safety and sustainability and some of the most abundant ocean resources and most certainly innovative people on the planet. This is our ocean opportunity. Today I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we leverage our collective ocean expertise, capabilities and innovation to take place on the global stage as a leader in the ocean economy while also being bold enough to do ocean business differently for the benefit of this generation and for generations to come. So what does it mean to be an ocean nation? As an accountant by background, I can certainly make the business case for ocean using GDP growth and other economic considerations. However, I thought you might appreciate if I don't spend too much time on that, Anyone involved with the Ocean Futures Innovation Hub discussions here in Victoria that I was lucky enough to also be able to participate in earlier this month can certainly share some of these details with you and the exciting opportunity that lies ahead. But for me, there's much more to it than that. Being an ocean nation is about identity. Defined by our historic connection to the ocean. Where we are today and where we see ourselves in the future. And I believe the Ocean Futures Innovation Hub is a very important part of that conversation. So as impressive as some of the numbers might be, being an ocean nation is more than just the facts and figures. It's about community. It's about people and the fabric of who we are and what we can be. As a little girl, and this is me. My father was in the military. We lived six places before I was five years old. One of those was Moosonee, and so the story goes, and depending on who told it, my father was forced to spend either a few hours or the night on an island in James Bay because he underestimated the power of the tides. I also lived in Chester, Nova Scotia, we lived there when my father went to sea as a petty officer in the Navy, 285 days the year my brother was born, and my mother counted every one of them. My grandmother retired in Chester, and many of my earliest memories are tied to summer visits to her, whether it's Queensland Beach, learning to swim in the Lido pool on the ocean, or Herbie, the fisherman on the wharf who tried to explain to me the best ingredients for chum. In our family, the ocean meant beauty, recreation, danger, and most certainly a way of life. What the ocean could give and what it could take away. Many years later, my daughter is developing her own relationship with the ocean, and who knows where it will lead her. It is important to recognize that each of us has a relationship with the ocean, no matter how near or far we find ourselves from the water. Every we take comes from the ocean. And with the tremendous pressure the ocean is, on, is under and our impact on it, now is most certainly the time to understand that relationship better. So surprisingly to me, as a girl who ultimately grew up in Ontario, I find that it is now my work that is connected to the ocean. And my relationship with the ocean continues to evolve. I spent almost 25 years with my previous employer on three continents and in five cities, helping businesses solve their challenges, grow and think differently. Two years ago, that work led me back to the ocean, where as a CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, I have embarked on my most exciting journey yet. Now what gets me up every morning is the work we are doing to help transform our ocean economy in a way that has never been done before. A couple of stats, by 2030, the global ocean economy will double in size to become a $3 trillion opportunity. It is likely that the pandemic will slow down that growth given some of the significant impacts 
on ocean sectors, but the opportunity remains significant and it is projected to outpace the growth of the broader economy. And in the midst of this incredible opportunity are threats to the well being of our oceans acidification, rising temperatures, plastics, and more that are all part of the global ocean conversation and in need of solutions. So if there was ever a time for Canada to emerge as a global leader in ocean, it is now. This is the work of Canada's ocean supercluster. At first glance, you might see our mandate as funding ocean technology projects. But what we are doing and trying to do is much more than that. Canada's ocean supercluster projects are hard because they are transformational. A long time ago, it was said by Theodore Roosevelt that nothing great ever came easy. And that certainly captures the essence of the approach we've taken. Facilitating collaboration between ocean industries who have never considered working together before. Developing game-changing innovative ocean projects where the biggest of ocean enterprises work with the smaller companies to rapidly innovate and sell their projects, products to the world. Leveraging machine learning, digital twin, virtual training, sensing, environmental technologies, real-time operational decision support, business model innovation, remote and autonomous platform development, and other potential project areas to improve our competitiveness across the most traditional ocean industries, as well as those that are emerging. All while also creating new ocean companies and growing them. So we are not only setting ourselves up for success today, but also for long into the future. This is about change, a new mindset and a new opportunity. Our two program streams, technology leadership focused on projects that commercialize innovative technology and our innovative ecosystem projects that are focused on addressing gaps in the ocean innovation ecosystem work hand in hand to accelerate ocean growth. And while none of that is easy, and admittedly has been even more challenging over the last six months, we are on a journey to make it great. Today I call St. John's Newfoundland and Labrador home. It is where I met my husband and built a family. The Ocean Supercluster team spans six cities across the Atlantic region. And while we do not currently have staff on the West Coast, we have been very lucky to have increasing connections with the very impressive West Coast ocean innovation ecosystem. As we look at future growth of our staff, extending our physical presence across the country will be an important consideration. Our team has an unwavering passion for ocean innovation and, and they have been working tirelessly to lay the groundwork for transformative, sustainable, ocean growth in Canada. But our only success comes from working with our members, many of whom have built their lives around the ocean. We engage with industry, business, government and communities across Canada, understanding those ocean challenges that have global relevance and collaborating to develop solutions using new technologies that will not only solve problems, but also bring benefits, including jobs and towns where we live. So maybe before I talk about where we're going, I'm going to take a step back and tell you a little bit more about how Canada's ocean supercluster came to be. In 2017, our federal government announced an almost $1 billion investment to support the establishment of five business-led innovation superclusters in Canada, with the greatest potential for energizing the economy and acting as engines of change and hubs for growth. 
One of the key objectives of this program is to change our reputation as an innovation nation. From this process, Canada's Ocean Supercluster has been led out of Atlantic Canada, where we are focused on harnessing emerging technologies to strengthen the country's ocean industries, including marine renewable energy, fisheries, aquaculture, offshore resources, defense, shipbuilding, and transportation, like you saw earlier in our video. And it's through the co-investment of more than $300 million by the private sector and our federal government that we are effectively building a supercluster of ocean sectors with a shared vision of reducing the costs and risks of doing business in the ocean, increasing connections across ocean industries, developing world-class talent, and increasing our reach with global companies throughout the world. This is truly a nation building approach to leveraging the opportunity for our ocean economy. By aligning the system, academia, research, government, as well as large and small industry, we are well on the path to unlocking our full potential as an ocean nation, because today so much of it remains untapped. It also means developing our ocean industries and advancing our position as a global leader in the way that addresses both the health and wealth of our oceans, not as separate objectives, but as one. I often say as a country, we don't know what we know. And so one of our very first project activities was to work with a number of partners to begin to develop Canada's ocean asset map an evergreen Google for ocean capabilities in Canada to not only help us gather this information, but also to begin to tell our story to the world. You can find this on our website, and this helps anyone around the world get easy access to the depth and breadth of our ocean resources. Harnessing that information, gauging our combined ocean capabilities as a country, and then talking about it getting to know what we know is one of the most compelling and powerful things we could do to advance our position as a leader in ocean. And this is leading to new and powerful collaborations from coast to coast to coast. So let's reflect a little on the activities of the ocean supercluster. We had our first member join the supercluster in May 2019 and held our first members event just one year ago in November. We were really just getting started. At our first members event, we had just over 130 members. We had announced only one project. While there were many technology leadership projects in discussion, only a few proposals had been submitted. Early work was underway, pulling together several ecosystem projects, including the startup project, Canada's asset map, and the Indigenous Career Pivot Pilot project. It was a pivotal time for us as we moved from foundation building as a supercluster to activation this year. And what a year it has been. Nobody could have predicted how 2020 would unfold and while it has come with incredible challenges and deep adverse impacts due to the global pandemic, it has also been a time when we have seen something quite remarkable happening. In the past seven months, we have seen our members adapt, pivot, and innovate during this unprecedented time. As I often say, it's in our ocean sectors where some of the most significant opportunities for economic recovery and long-term growth exist. And I will continue to say it, and I'd encourage you to do the same. Each of our coasts comes with its own unique opportunities and challenges, and with one voice from coast to coast to coast, I believe we have our best chance because we need Canadians everywhere to understand just how big Canada's ocean opportunity really is. While we've always had an open call program at the Ocean Supercluster, accepting proposals whenever they were submitted, in April, 
we asked ourselves what we could do differently to respond to the needs of our members with the impact of the COVID pandemic. We created a new program, our Accelerated Ocean Solutions Program that launched in May 2020 with the first proposals approved in early July. This call-based program was for smaller scale projects with shorter timelines focused on specific technology areas we really felt would remain relevant despite the impacts of COVID. Remote operations, digital solutions, and environmental technologies. And we had a tremendous response from across the country. A huge thank you to Mayor Helps, Alex Rubin at ABCMI, and all those who helped get the word out on the West Coast. The response was so great that we ran a second call throughout the summer to make sure that everyone that had a great project in those areas of focus would have to, the chance to pull their proposal together. Our first call also included an innovation ecosystem project component focused on capacity building in those same specific areas and it also saw a number of great projects come through. As a result of this increased call-based activity, we received over 250 project ideas through the two calls with well over 400 companies engaged. Since March 2020, we have approved 36 projects which are currently working their way through contracting, our total approved project value is now just over 200 million. We now have almost 320 members in eight provinces and one territory and 13 sectors. This includes 50 members in BC, which is a significant increase from just six months ago and speaks to the incredible opportunity to do even more together in the months ahead. So let's talk about our projects for a few minutes. Our first project is the Ocean Vision Project. And I thought it was important to get Bill Donovan from Kraken to share his thoughts on this project directly with you. The goal of Kraken was, was to develop innovations that are not there today. If we can develop products that are bigger and better than what's out in the market today, we will be able to compete. We are a marine technology company focused on the design and development of underwater sensors and vehicles. Ocean Vision, which turned out to be the very first project approved by the Ocean Supercluster, we, we designed and developed and tested a new autonomous launch and recovery system. Our involvement was very much key to the, the growth of the company and it allowed us to take a project that we had probably on our, our five to six year um, development roadmap through the Ocean Supercluster. Um, we're able to take that and, and condense it into a 36 month timeline. And since that time, we have grown our company in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia by 42 employees. We have partners from multiple industries and sectors that we probably wouldn't have also been able to avail of without the initiative of the Ocean Supercluster. But as well too, it's allowing us to really ramp up the development scale of it. We had a, a couple of announcements in the last few weeks with regards to two significant commercial contracts that we landed, one with the Danish Navy and one with the Polish Navy. Through that project, we're going to deliver full mine hunting systems. So that was a process that we started over two years ago. We got down to a final four. The other three companies that we're competing with are large defense contractors in the US and in Europe. And a lot bigger than us, have uh, more cash, more employees, but we beat them. And we beat them with our technology. We need to continue to invest in oceans. We need to stay focused on that. So I think it's really key for governments to look at that the complete chain right from uh, concept to uh, development to testing to commercialization. It's really important that we don't sit back and wait, but we, we put the pedal to the metal and try and drive it as much as we can. I think the opportunities are, are there. We just need to chase after them. 
So we are looking forward to many new exciting things over the coming months from the Ocean Vision team. The Ocean Startup Project is focused on increasing the number of ocean startups, making Canada the best place to start and grow an ocean company. Their recent Ocean Challenge was a worldwide challenge that attracted 158 companies to make submissions with 14 winners named who received $25,000 to advance their ocean solution. Lab to Market also started in September to help researchers with an interest in commercialization and the first Creative Destruction Lab Ocean cohort began this month. So lots of work happening to help entrepreneurs turn their ocean ideas into reality. The Indigenous Career Pivot Pilot is focused on providing up to 10 mid-career Indigenous workers with skills or trades in other sectors, a 12-month placement with small to medium-sized businesses in the ocean sector. Recognizing the connection Indigenous people have to the water, but also the opportunity to increase their participation in the ocean economy. If this pilot is we are hoping to be able to expand the program to an increased number of workers and other underrepresented groups. The Ocean Aware Project. Again, I thought I'd share this quick video with you explaining this project. In a first of its kind collaboration across ocean sectors and fisheries, aquaculture, energy, shipping and ocean technology, Canada's Ocean Supercluster is supporting the coming together of large and small industry partners, including SMEs and startups, to deliver an underwater observation systems project designed to provide world-class solutions for monitoring fish health, fish movement, and the environment, and support both profitable and sustainable practices in the ocean. With a total value of $29 million, Canada's Ocean Supercluster is excited to announce the Ocean Aware Project, which is led by Innovasea, together with partners including Amera, Nova Scotia Power, Ocean Choice International, Irving Shipbuilding, Dartmouth Ocean Technologies, Zeos Technologies, and with the support of the Ocean Tracking Network, Dalhousie University, Memorial University, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Together, the Ocean Aware project team will develop world-leading aquaculture technology to monitor fish health, new approaches to stock observation in the wild fishery, and innovative and increased capability to monitor marine life around fixed subsea structures that will not only enable ocean growth that is sustainable, but also disrupt competition on a global scale, position Canada as a leader, and help grow the economy and create new jobs. Canada's ocean supercluster is changing the way ocean business is done. As you heard, the Ocean Aware Project is an ambitious project with 11 collaborators, $29 million focused on monitoring fish health, fish movement, and the environment. And lastly, I'll talk about today our Ocean DNA System Project, revolutionizing how we assess, monitor, and characterize the ocean, reading DNA from water samples versus more traditional and more cumbersome processes used in the past. And there's a lot more exciting news to come in the coming weeks. Momentum is building. We can feel the energy, but there is still lots to do. We are certainly excited to see the outcomes of these projects. As many of you are aware, the Government of Canada has committed to the development and delivery of a blue economy strategy. This will effectively shape the development of the roadmap for investment and growth for Canada's ocean economy. The strategy falls under the mandate of Minister Bernadette Jordan, where the Blue Economy Secretariat has been established to lead this work. Our team and board has been working with senior officials in government to help engage and inform the process. We expect a period of consultation to begin in the coming months, where we look forward to supporting that process and providing opportunities for you to have your voice heard. We know how important that is to you. 
While we can't say with certainty what exactly the strategy will look like, what I will say is that you can count on the productivity and health of our oceans to be a key focus. Minister Jordan confirmed at an event in July of this year that government will be working to protect 25% of Canada's oceans by 2025 and up to 30% by 2030, all in support of advancing the blue economy strategy. The greening of ocean industries isn't new to anyone here today, I'm sure. It's something we've all been thinking about and working towards for a while. As we consider our projects, understanding the demand for new technologies, information and solutions to help achieve these targets, while also providing economic benefits are of high interest. Many were waiting for the speech from the throne to better understand the path forward and priorities of government. While the continued response to the pandemic was a key focus, when it came to addressing the economy, Ocean was singled out as an area where investment with, will help Canada prosper. That there will be continued focus on the blue economy, as well as commentary around supporting oil and gas companies as they transition to a net zero future. What we can take away from all of this is that investment, growth, and balancing health and wealth of the ocean are a part of the agenda, and the ocean supercluster is an instrumental part of that. As this momentum builds, the world is taking notice. There is increasing interest in Canada's ocean supercluster from countries around the world. It's something I heard consistently when I was able to travel to key markets internationally, which seems like a long time ago now. <laughs> Strategies being developed in other countries that are focused on working with Canada's ocean supercluster, and these continue to evolve and have transitioned to virtual events. Beyond this, there is also an expanding number of countries looking, how to in, looking at how to encourage cross-cluster collaboration versus the more silent approach that was generally acceptable before as a model of choice. This points to the reach of Canada's Ocean Supercluster brand and the strength of our Canadian model and the desire of players to not just engage with us, but also to start to learn from us, part of establishing Canada's leadership. So are we achieving what we set out to achieve? When I think about this, I can't help but reflect on a true moment of inspiration that I experienced in Pond Inlet in Nunavut last year. It was a chance meeting that I will never forget. I was en route to participate in the Royal Canadian Navy's Canadian Leaders at Sea program that would bring me to a small community at the northern tip of Baffin Island. Due to a scheduling change, I was unexpectedly going to spend two days in the community of Pond Inlet, graciously housed by the RCMP as accommodation is a challenge. During my time there, I had the opportunity to explore and engage with many in the community, as well as watching a cultural show. But the opportunity to meet and learn more about a group called Ecarvic was really the highlight for me. For anyone who knows me well, you know I am a big proponent of youth challenges, hackathons, and competitions where young people put their heads together and put their uninhibited thinking to the test to help solve a problem and sometimes even change the world. I understand that a karvik means bridge in Inuktitut, quite fitting of a group that leverages Inuit knowledge science and innovation, and that same kind of uninhibited thinking to solve local challenges and improve the lives of others. Working to together towards a common goal, not as individuals, but as one, and making a difference for their community. A great example of a group 
that has already figured it out and an inspiration for us all as we consider the Canada Ocean Supercluster journey. At Canada's Ocean Supercluster, we are working to encourage new collaborations on a national scale to be able to develop more integrated solutions to some of the most challenging problems in the ocean. And we are seeing that start to happen. In a short period of time, we have seen companies working together in different ocean industries who have never even heard of one another, let alone met, who now have the opportunity to share ideas and are now developing project proposals for the supercluster and are also looking at opportunities to work together on non supercluster activities. We have also begun to see a shift in mindset across the country towards Canadian collaboration and its importance in increasing our global competitiveness, solving ocean challenges and transforming our ocean economy. And we know that we have really just scratched the surface. Canada's ocean supercluster is changing the way ocean business is done. As we advance our position as an ocean nation and take our place as a global leader, I cannot overemphasize how important and how transformational the potential is for our communities and our country. We will engage, listen, learn, collaborate, innovate, and solve shared ocean challenges together, while also building the talent pipeline and an inclusive innovation ecosystem that is robust and ready to continue the trajectory of growth in ocean innovation that extends beyond our mandate. We will show leadership in approaching ocean health, not as an impediment to the ocean economy, but instead a responsibility we all have to achieve the right balance, the give and take, because that is the way of the ocean. You will continue to see lots of ocean supercluster activity in the coming months. We will have an episode of Amazon Prime's The Future Code dedicated to the activities of Canada's ocean supercluster later this year. Filming took place in the Atlantic bubble in late September, early October, and expected to air across the UK, US, and Canada later this fall. We continue to feature our members in a 12-week series. We have a story to tell. We have many projects to announce in the coming weeks, and in the coming months, we will start to see the impacts of those projects. Our monthly newsletter shares thoughts from leaders and our news. You can follow us on social media channels. We are quite active across Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. As these and other materials start circulating this fall, we encourage you to share them in your newsletters, on your social media, and across your networks. We'd also invite you to use the hashtag OceanNation in your posts so we can amplify the dialogue happening online around our ocean economy. No one person, one company, one industry, or one province can do this alone. It takes all of us. And if I may borrow the words of Ryanosuke Satoro, individually, we are just one drop. Together, we are an ocean. I hope my remarks brought new insight, information, and perhaps an interest in getting involved with Canada's ocean supercluster. There is capacity for everyone who wants to engage to get involved. One of my very last trips in March was to Vancouver to join an ABCMI event. I do so look forward to the opportunity to get back out west someday soon. I look forward to answering any questions and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And I will leave you with one final thought, which I have quoted repeatedly from one of our startup members. 
While others are pulling up the handbrake, let's continue to put our foot on the gas. Thank you, Kendra, very much. And we also hope to see you out here very soon in British Columbia once again. You should come all the way west and come to Vancouver Island. To I should. To yes, Absolutely. you really should, should do that. <laughs> so thank you very much. Come on out and visit me. I am right now living in and uh, working on the ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, in particular, the Lekwungen speaking nations of the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And I'd like to recognize that. So we have some questions in the queue here. So uh, those of you that are among our, our participants today, please go to the Q&A feature on the bottom, put your question in there. It is 10 to 11 minutes after one. We'll get to, to as much as we can uh, through the rest of the program here. We're going to cut it off around 1.30. You know, Kendra, I have to, so, so as you mentioned, we're the digital technology supercluster on the West Coast, and you're the ocean supercluster, but watching those videos and seeing the parts that you have, we have a lot of that here. You know, and as you probably know, the city of Victoria, you mentioned Lisa Helps. I'm a part of that plan that's trying to create an ocean cluster, not a supercluster, but an ocean cluster here. What's our potential to grow? How big can we get? Can we become a super cluster? Yeah, so so that I mean, I think from a super cluster, so if you think about why super clusters, right, is is that we think these are places where Canada can be globally, global leaders. And so if you look at the opportunity that sits in ocean, and I, I know I talked a little bit about it, but the global opportunity in terms of the projected growth in the next 10 years. Uh, if you look at Canada in terms of where we sit in our GDP contribution and just getting to the world average would be a huge amount of growth. We need the West Coast and the East Coast and we need the Arctic. We need the whole country working together to really understand the opportunity. And so, I mean, my greatest wish is that we've got all of, we're, we're on all cylinders in terms of growing the ocean economy. Yeah, one of our remarkable organizations here, of course, is Ocean Networks Canada. And uh, Kate Moran from that organization and Alex Rubin from ABCMI, who you also mentioned, the three of us spoke with some people at a facility in Halifax called Cove, C-O-V-E. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And then we'll go to some questions here. Yeah, absolutely. So the Center for Ocean Ventures, so it is a physical hub, right? So it's in the old Coast Guard building in Halifax, and I think they're up to 70 tenants. And so they really have a co-location and they've got a number of programs that they run, I think one of which is in capacity building, and that one again runs uh, from coast to coast. And so I think they've really demonstrated the power of having multiple organizations of different sizes that are in the same space and, and really creating collisions and new opportunities to be able to work together. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's a great model. And, and what we're seeing is actually globally, uh, COVE is relatively unique in terms of uh, how it operates, which is exciting. Okay, so I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here that are in the uh, Q&A feature on the bottom. Uh, is it actually possible to protect the ocean while doing business? And is the supercluster looking at any projects to remove harmful mater materials rather from the ocean, such as plastics? So that's where business and environment kind of mesh together, right? Yeah, so I mean, let me start with the first part. I think we have to, right? So when we look at the growth opportunity that exists in ocean and we look at the stress that the ocean is already under, if we don't figure out a way to be able to do that together, then, uh, then we, we just won't succeed because we will destroy the ocean and quite frankly, life on earth, right? Which is which is highly connected. Every second breath we take is, is connected to the ocean. So if we get this wrong, it, it's a big deal. Um, and so, you know, if you look at, um, high level panel on sustainability, for example, they look at protection, production and prosperity. And so really, how do we do those things together? And they talk a lot about, you know, the ocean having some of its own solutions. They talk about uh, finding a way to be able, and in different countries have different examples of where they've, by focusing on the pro protecting the ocean, they actually get more economic value. And so, you know, we see them, one of our, one of our board members says it's, a, it's our dance with the ocean. So how do we, you know, get the economic opportunity without causing harm? And in fact, if we look at, I think I might have shared the example uh, in terms of the wild fishery, you know, the more that we do to be able to protect fish stocks, the longer they will last um, and the stronger they will be in terms of the food security of the future, aquaculture, there's all kinds of examples of of the better we do in taking care of our ocean, the more productive it will be for us. In terms of specific, I think your second part of your question was plastic. Is it plastic Removing pollution? plastics, yeah, and other things that damage the ocean. Yeah, so I mean, so in terms of the, the ocean super cluster, it's an economic development program. So to the extent that there are ideas that have a commercial outcome, 
then uh, we would look at investing in that. I think when it comes to a lot of the plastics, we also have the Ocean Protection Plan, which is a Canadian program that I think is a billion dollars. And so a lot of the marine protected areas, the, the plastic pollution, those types of things fall probably more under the scope of that plan than of the ocean supercluster. But to the extent there's a commercial potential, then it would fit within the supercluster mandate. Because yeah, the cleanup would create jobs, right? And, and clean up the ocean. Uh, another one- Well, there's lots of, I mean, just to comment on that, there's lots of great examples of finding the plastics, reusing the plastic, creating businesses out of that plastic. And there's a view that, you know, as we eliminate single use plastic, the value of plastic will actually change. And so finding that plastic and getting value uh, from it will actually become an interesting new problem. Yeah, we need to get other countries on board with that too. Somewhat related to that, if ocean project proposals have to have a component of sustainability or environmental considerations included to be considered for funding, what does that look like? Yeah, so great question. I actually did, a, I saw the question, so I did a quick, quick flip through. There's nothing specifically that talks about sustainability objectives. We have two types of objectives for projects, one of which is our mandatory growth criteria focused on growth back to that commercialization, export, value, et cetera. Then the second piece is around um, sort of uh, economic contribution. So really we see our projects as contributing to the ecosystem beyond itself, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to strengthen our ocean ecosystem and therefore the overall sort of ocean activity for the country. Having said that, a lot of our projects are in the digital space. They're looking at digitizing the ocean. They're looking at getting better information. They're looking at better decision-making. And because they're collaborative, you've got multiple parties that are working together. And so you're only gathering information once for multiple purposes as, as opposed to going multiple times. So inherently a lot of our projects are sustainable and we certainly would consider that, but it is not an explicit criteria. You probably have the ability to bring competitors together too under this. Yeah, so, so we do. I mean, those are always interesting conversations. I mean, the, the super cluster brings cross sectoral. Uh, we've had, we actually on our board have some competitors from different provinces that are now working together to grow the ocean economy. Um, so the trick is being able to, you know, ultimately you're signing an agreement together. So you've got to be able to find a place where you can trust each other to be able to work within that agreement. It's a co opetition is probably the best term I've heard to be able to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so through VIEA, a number of us for a few years have heard about the program that's been initiated for a new seaweed aquaculture industry that's here on the island region by writing a business case that's now been pursued by a company called Cascadia Seaweed, who were a part of a fin fish and aquaculture session we did yesterday. What can the super cluster do to help facilitate BC government's ability to move more quickly to respond to the need for licensing approvals to help this transformational industry take advantage of this enormous carbon negative opportunity and significantly contribute to coastal First Nation economies? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. I mean, to date, we haven't done a lot of advocacy like that. So it tends to be more to the, um, to the individual group, whether that's Kaya or um, you know, the marine transportation, whatever those areas are. Ha having said that, you know, there, there is where it makes sense just to even having a conversation. So when I think about the super cluster again, there's what the super cluster can do for Canada. And then what that looks like in terms of complementary investment varies very much by province. So whether that's BC or Quebec or, or the Atlantic provinces. And so, you know, been having that conversation to say, we really need to think about what will move this forward and how do you take full advantage, like, like the conversation around the hub, how do we take full advantage of this forward momentum? And, you know, how do we get the barriers out of the way so that we can move quickly? And certainly seaweed globally is gaining a huge amount of crack traction. We don't want Canada to, to fall behind. Um, also glad to hear, oh, you know what? But we're still with the seaweed thing. That involves packaging too. That can change the whole nature of packaging because it would then create less need for plastic too. Really great comment came out in a session this morning about the indigenous economy that the coastal nations and indigenous people for a long time and forever actually have considered the ocean to be their farm because that's where they draw fish. And it was interesting to see that there is a protein super cluster sort of in the middle of Canada. That's an Alberta, Saskatchewan thing, I believe. So yeah, the food source for this is so important, it really is. Uh, glad to hear your support for the development of the Marine Hub on Vancouver Island. Is there a plan for super cluster staff representation here to help accelerate the Pacific involvement? So the best thing I can say is is maybe. <laughs> so we're um, we have maybe. a number. What's that? A definite maybe. 
A, de a definite maybe. So we've been looking, we've been looking at it. So we've had, I think I mentioned it, you know, we've had an increase in the number of, um, in the number of uh, members. And we will see over the coming months as we've got these projects that we'll see an increase in projects out here as well. And so to the extent it makes sense. Now, what we're finding now is where our people are for the moment is relatively agnostic because there's so much that is happening virtually. So I think as we come back out of that and, and even I'm, I'm, I'm traveling for the first time in a few weeks time within the bubble, um, but as we come out of that and we start you know, seeing face to face again, then, then we'll rethink. But right now, we're finding in this virtual world that that is for us as a super cluster allowed us to connect in a way that we were challenged to do when we had everyone traveling in person. Uh, there was an announcement not too long ago about some federal funding that's going to be extended to BC Ferries who sponsored this session. But the, the, you know, the maritime ferries have been funded by the government at a very high level for a long time because they're interprovincial and it's a different classification between, I think it's highways or, and I'm sorry, I forget the details of that. But we've, you know, the West Coast, BC in particular, compared to the Maritimes, our population has doubled over the last 25 years and the Maritimes has stayed pretty much the same. Are you at capacity with this super cluster? Do you have room to grow? Because we sure do. Uh, and so, so again, I mean, I think about the super cluster as Canada. So I think from a Canadian perspective, we absolutely have room to grow. And I think that you know, as we're seeing more and more of those east west connections, I think that's incredibly exciting. And I think that creates opportunities for our Atlantic Canadian companies, our, you know, our Western Canadian companies, our Ontario companies, which there are actually a surprising number, perhaps, of members that sit in Ontario. So I don't really spend a lot of time trying to think through um, west versus east. I do think there's an incredible growth opportunity in the west. And I think that you know, ocean, while it's obvious in the Maritimes, or I should say the Maritimes in Atlantic Canada, it's not always, it's competing with many more things happening on the West Coast. And I think the attention that it's getting uh, with the mayor and the focus on the future of ocean is incredibly exciting for, for the entire country. Even think about the, the optic of it culturally, that throughout our history, there've been way more songs written about East Coast fishing than there has about West Coast fishing, right? There's a whole culture around that. Uh, another question here, being a super cluster and having everything under one big umbrella may be somewhat restrictive in the diversity and growth in order to mitigate and spread the word and expand interest and opportunities. Do you have plans to develop mini clusters or many mini clusters to cover such a vast shoreline area that we have in Canada? Yeah, so I mean, I think it, it's happening a bit uh, grassroots, right? So I think as particular um, parts of the country look at what the opportunity is and, and what it means for them. We're seeing, we are seeing many clusters. We already had uh, in terms of the associations, whether it's ABCMI or whether it's, um, you know, TMQ or OTAC, or there, there were several organizations that were around. And so, you know, I think that what the super cluster brand I think does for us internationally is it draws attention to ocean for Canada. Right, and one of the challenges that we've heard internationally is it's very difficult to figure out how to navigate the Canadian landscape because you don't know if you should go to the West Coast or to the East Coast. Are you going to Nova Scotia? Are you going to Newfoundland? Should you be going to Quebec? And so it makes it very difficult when you're trying to plan a road trip. This gives them a door in. They can go on our website. They can look at the asset map. They can see the, the companies, the breadth of companies across the country and, and get themselves in. And then I think that strengthens everything that's happening at an individual level by having the overall brand for the country. So the super cluster there would have been created because you had all of the elements within what you're talking about within the whole marine cluster. What's missing? Is there anything that's missing or is there something that you, that you, you feel should be in that mix that you don't have now? Well, so I mean, if you think about what cluster theory is not to get too far into it but I mean that's getting government and large business and small business and academia and the investor community all sort of going in the same direction and so I think you know at least in what we've heard right there was a lot of um, one there was just a lack of knowledge so we have introduced companies to each other that are now working together that wouldn't have met uh, without the super cluster I think technology if I was to pick one we're, we're seeing more and more technology companies coming in so I think Ocean, like other uh, um, parts of the economy, other sectors, is digitizing. You know, and you think about media or you think about other more traditional areas, um, we're digitizing. But I think people think about ocean science maybe first. 
rather than ocean technology. So we more, need more of our tech companies. And I think that's why there's a huge opportunity for central Canada as well to bring some of the great technology we have, whether it's AI, whether it's robotics, how do we bring that to, uh, to the ocean economy? When we go back to the cleaning up of the ocean and making sure that it's, that it's clean and sustainable for all the purposes to, to sustain life for all of us, what kind of relationship or what kind of conversations can happen with other countries who don't feel the way we do? And I'm not gonna name names, but there are a couple of countries that probably account for about 35% of all the plastic that goes into the ocean. That's a political thing, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what I will say is I think to the extent that we continue to strengthen Canada, so Canada has a very strong brand internationally. And I think to the extent that we are growing our ocean economy, it gives us a, a very strong position in leading a global conversation and maybe having a different influence. And so one of the things that I've heard is Canada is not at enough of the tables that are driving the conversation forward. Um, and a number of these conversations when it comes to ocean protection, they are happening at an international level. So, you know, I think that there's a real opportunity for us to, to continue again, to strengthen our, our leadership and then to bring that leadership internationally. And we in the South Island in particular have a very strong presence of shipyards, of graving docks, and uh, a lot of the work that's done there is some is domestic, but a lot of it comes from away. Uh, what's your capacity there for that? Do you have room to expand uh, or do you have room to bring in ships from other parts of the world? Uh, so, I mean, there's shipbuilding on the East Coast as well, if, if that's an Atlantic specific question. I, I don't know the details of that, but, but certainly, obviously, part of the, there's been huge capacity built on the East Coast with the shipbuilding program, as well as on the West Coast. Yeah, we have, uh, well, C-SPAN is here at Point Hope Shipyard and other uh, companies that are a little smaller operation, too, that, uh, that are creating uh, ships of a little smaller size, but yeah, we do right. Ir Irving Shipbuilding would have the you know a big presence on the on the East Coast as well, right. and I think the Royal Canadian Canadian Navy has got a big presence on both as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, Irving would be competitors for C-SPAN, I think, on some of this. Um, coastal MPs in BC have for years been trying to get strong legislation to deal with the issue of abandoned vessels that sink and pollute without government intervention. Anything happening about that? So from a super cluster perspective, not that I'm aware of, I would think again, that would fall more in the ocean protection plan than in the scope of the ocean super cluster, unless again, it had some kind of commercial uh, commercial focus to it. Okay, uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, yes, we wanna know when you are coming out here to visit. We wanna make sure that you get to see all the elements on Vancouver Island that make up our marine cluster here. So there's lots to do. Any closing remarks, anything you wanna say just to wrap us up? Yeah, so I mean, first, firstly, I, I was out there and there's a tremendous amount that's happening. In fact, I was with Kate uh, in terms of, I can't remember exactly where we were in doing the presentation, but had the opportunity to be there. I mean, I think the one message I, I would reinforce is this is a Canadian play. So as much as, you know, the super cluster sits in Atlantic Canada, I don't think we think digital is only a West Coast play, or we think that, you know, AI is only a Quebec play, right? These are Canadian plays. And so I really encourage you to think about, you know, how do we grow Canada and how do we grow the opportunity for Canada? And I think what's going on in the West Coast is absolutely a tremendous contributor to where we can go as an ocean nation overall. Yeah, I mean, there's areas like Port Alberni have great capacity to grow in, in a whole bunch of different ways and other parts of the island too. Uh, Kendra McDonald, CEO, Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Thanks. How's the weather in Newfoundland today, by the way? Uh, it is not as wet as it was yesterday, and it's quite chilly, and probably chillier than on the West Coast. <laughs> is, there, is there any white stuff around? Any not yet, no. Okay, because one of the advantages, of course, we have is our weather for all of this that's related stuff, right? I, I know. Unfortunately, my husband lives here, and he's from Newfoundland. Um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's a beautiful part of the world and wonderful people, that's for sure. As they say, it's about the people, not the weather. And in my case, it's definitely about the people. So There you go. Um, do you have screech in your house right now? I, I do, absolutely, always. Necessity. Although we don't drink it much, but we have it for the guests. It's for emergencies, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kendra McDonald, thanks very much. Where can people reach out to you? Uh, so they can go to our website uh, is probably the easiest. Uh, you can reach out to me. I'm, I'm relatively easy to find LinkedIn, Twitter. We're all over social media. So lots of ways to get a hold of us. All right. Well, we hope to see you out here sooner than later. Thank you for being with us. We have a, a lovely gift for you from our friends at St. Jean's Cannery, an Indigenous-owned uh, operation on Vancouver Island in Nichilmouth. 
uh, seafood people are going to make that possible for you. And thanks once again to BC Ferries for their sponsorship for this event. And thanks to all of you for attending today. Enjoy the rest of your sessions. I'm Bruce Williams from the Victoria Chamber. We'll see you all next time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kendra.